Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hey, it's a good time Amen. to be in the Lord's house. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Amen. So it's going to be a, a wonderful conference. We're already pumped up and ready to go. And so as people are coming in, I want to make a, a few announcements. One is um, we have some upcoming events. This next Tuesday, at seven, which is April the 24th at 7 o'clock, Caleb Brundage and Spring Hume will be ministering here. Um, so it's always fun when they come. Never know what he's going to do next. And so, but we love Caleb and Spring. They're our brother and sister, and, and uh, we're connected. So they're coming on Tuesday, this next Tuesday, April next weekend at... Uh, I think starting at 7, they're having uh, Caleb and uh, Brian and Kat Vaughn will be hosting uh, Rally OKC. Amen. So they will be here. They The tickets are $25 for the weekend. They will have praise and worship time. They will have... Um, they will have workshops it's for it's if you're creative. Of course, everybody's creative because God's a creator God and he's created all of us. So... Some worse than other, yeah. Well, there's different creative bents, and so they will have different workshops. They'll have workshops on the flags. They're going to have workshops on, I think, art, um, prophetic art. Um, usually, oh, come on, stay. Uh, dream, I think it's dream interpretation. I don't know. Don't uh, they, they? You can go on Facebook and and see all their different workshops. And so it's twenty five dollars for the weekend, and you you will want to come to that. And then the next conference we have here is May fourth and fifth, which will be Randy Demain, Steve Swanson, and Joanne McFadder. So we're going to have a kingdom advancement. So it's going to be a great time, and so you'll want to get online and check out the things that are coming. Also, the week that, starting May 1st, they're having a, um, it's called Firestorm, which is an um, evangelism outreach, uh, going to be down in Bricktown, at, behind the state at Sonic, Sonic Stage, yes, yes, Sonic Stage, and um, so it's going to kind of flow in, and we're going to kind of flow in and out with them for the weekend, so it's going to be a good time. I want to also direct your attention that in the back room and behind the sound booth, behind and through that door is the well, which is the bookstore. There's all kinds of good stuff in there and some sales going on. So you'll want to check it out. And if you have, if you are need some light therapy, there's light therapy back there. Just talk to Laura, the manager of the bookstore, and she will hook you up. Also, there's a table back there. And on the table is products from Ian Johnson. Amen. So you always want to get all the products you can. And one thing we have, we only have two left, is the conference that he was here last year on called Glory Rods. It's on the table. And uh, so you'll want to check out that. If those two leave, then talk to Johnny. Oh, talk to Laura. I'm sorry. Sorry. Talk to Laura. See, I was trying to get my son involved, and he's like, yeah. So talk to Laura. Laura will get them for you. So, um, and, and then there's some books back there, a lot of books, but, or several books, but um, one is Heaven's Sons Revealed on Earth. And we've been talking about we need to take our place in the kingdom. We will never be able to go into the glory until we understand who we are in the glory. So this is a great book on who we are. Sons of God revealed. All sons and daughters are called to walk with God and to enjoy the realms of heaven. But most importantly, we are all called to release heaven on earth. So um, check this one out. Okay. And then glory to glory. is not, if, if you want to say anything, just jump in. Okay. Okay. He knows the author. They're good books. I agree. Hallelujah. I know the author. They're good books. Okay. Glory to Glory, A Journey of Intimacy and Worship. So this is a walk into intimacy with Christ is a journey. And it starts when we first turn our lives over to him and learn how to navigate the courts of heaven in this life. 
So the division between heaven and earth is seamless because the veil, veil between the realms have been forever torn by the Lord. So this is a great book to walk into the glory, go to, from glory to glory. So you want to avail yourself of the products. There's other products back there that um, is great. We know the author. He's been here before. Glory. And, and the one who's in the author, Holy Spirit. So, say okay, so we're all, just check it out. We, we speak blessing over the book table and let it be sold out so we can bless in. So right now, is there anything else I need? Okay. okay, so let's just enter in. I want to welcome, you know, Matthew 10, 41 says, if we welcome the, the uh, righteous man in the name of a righteous man, we'll receive a righteous man reward. If we welcome a prophet in the name of a prophet, we'll receive the prophet's reward. And so we don't want, ever want to leave giftings and anointings laying on the ground. We want all that the Lord has for us. So all the earthly saints, we welcome you. We welcome your anointings, your giftings. We say that you're welcome in this place. This is home. So make yourself at home. Worship however the Holy Spirit will lead you to worship. We want to especially welcome Ian Johnson. He has been here before, but I want to welcome him in this place. He is a mighty man of God, a prophet in the house. He is a father. He has a father's heart. And I just, with Ian, he is a man who has walked and who has um, had many experiences, but he is willing to pour out of his life to bless the body. And so we as the body receive everything that the Lord has deposited in him for this time and this season. We give him complete authority in this house. We give him complete authority and Holy Spirit to do whatever Holy Spirit has him to do. We just welcome him. We, we pray that he is refreshed, revitalized, and that he has dreams and visitations as he's here, that he will leave this place in a much better frame than when he came. And he was in a great frame when he came. So we <laughs> be in a much better frame. So we just bless this man of God. And we give him freedom here. We welcome the musicians, all home folk, but we welcome you again. We want to give you permission that you are not cheerleaders. You are sons of Asaph who are guiding us and, and opening up the heavens that we can come in and have worship and, and we can have freedom to worship. We give you right, give you leave to go into the heavenlies, to hear the sounds of heaven, to bring them into the earth, that we can, can join in with the sounds. We give you leave to go where no man has gone before. Hallelujah. We give you leave to, to practice on us. It's not, about, it's not about the style. It's about the sound. And I know everyone on the stage and your sound extends through the realms. And so we give you leave to release your sound. So we also want to welcome the angelic ones, the mighty ones of God, the sons of God. We welcome them in this place. We give them leave to minister among us. We ask that the angels, you angelic ones, we don't want you to stand around the corners. We don't want you to look in upon us. We want you to walk among us and be with us and minister with us. That the whole, all that God has planned for and prepared for this season, for this time, for the, even tonight that's written down will be accomplished. Every dot, every tittle will be accomplished. So angelic ones, we welcome you in this place. Are you cloud of witnesses, the heavenly saints of the Most High? We welcome you in this place. We welcome your uh, wisdom. We welcome your your um, encouragement. We welcome your mantles. We welcome welcome you in this place again. We welcome you to walk among us and be with us. That we, as the host of the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Lord Sabaoth, can come together in unity. And we can accomplish all that God would have for the kingdom. 
For we are not those who are islands unto ourselves, but we want to become the kingdom. We want to stretch out and be all that the kingdom would have us, that the king of kings would have us to be. So most of all, we welcome heaven, the Holy Spirit. We welcome Holy Spirit. We welcome the three in one. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We say that wherever Holy Spirit is, there is liberty. So we give you a total liberty in this place. We give you total freedom. You have taken us out of the box and we say well, you are not to be in the box. We just break the box. And we say you are Holy Spirit. You are the most high. We welcome you in this place. Jesus Christ, you are the son of the, own, of the most high God. You are the only begotten son. And we recognize you as our king and as our Lord. You are the one who came onto this earth as a human. You are the one who walked this earth and that you rose, you died and you rose again. You are now our king. You are now our Lord. And we acknowledge you as that. We bow our knee to that and we say that your name is above every name, both in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And we welcome your authority in this place. And Father, you are the great I am. There is no one but you, O Lord. You are yud heh vav hey. You are the one who sits high upon the throne. You are the one that we worship. You are the one that was in the beginning. You are the one that is now. You are the one who will ever be. And we worship you. We open ourselves to you. We ask that our praise be sweet incense before you. Lord, we ask that whatever you would have us to do, Lord, we are open. We are open, O Lord. We praise you, mighty one. We worship you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. You are the Holy One. You are the Holy One. You are the Holy One. And we worship you now. We worship you, Lord. May the portals be open. May the portals be open. And may we enter in.
shake the seeds that, that the essence of creation flows. Is that not right? Is that true? And so when you shook it tonight, your, your seed spilled out. Why? Creation. Creation has come. Creation is entering in. Creation has become one with us tonight. And I say that we receive this in Jesus' name. Lord, I say that we receive whatever you would have from us from the beginning of creation to now. Lord, we welcome your creation in this place. We welcome that your seeds are falling on us. And Lord, we steward those seeds and we say thank you. We welcome right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we welcome the fact that it's now. Why is it right now? Because you have ordained it and you have said, let us set our minds on you. Let us set our minds on who you are. You are holy. Lord. You are the Holy One. You are the great and mighty one. There is no one but you, O Lord. There is no one but you, O Lord. You have scattered your seed on this place. And look how it has grown. Look how beautiful it is. Lord, we say we welcome you. We say we honor you. You are holy, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy, Lord. You are holy. You are holy.
the presence
for the holy God you are. For the angels call you holy. You holy. You holy. Holy. Holy Lord. Holy. Holy. Holy Lord. Holy.
Let's just keep in that atmosphere of worship. And um, I just really want to lift a, a sound of thanksgiving up before the Lord for the seed, because it's so important um, that we thank Him for the seed. Um, just keep playing in the background, guys. Um, the last time, last time something like this happened was many years ago in Christchurch, New Zealand. And um, I got, just the preacher is American, who's your name, nameless, but um, he, d he felt like the Lord said, buy a sack of wheat. And um, he bought a sack of wheat and, uh, and a shovel. And, um, and he went into the auditorium and um, I'd hate to be the people vacuuming that night, but um, he just, he got a shovel and he started to, he just started to like throw wheat all around the place. And it was like, I knew God was in it. And I felt sorry for the vacuum cleaner people, but I knew God was in it. I could see that God was up to something and God was preparing like Christchurch for something um, because there was a harvest coming. Um, and um, Christchurch has had a few issues since then, but, um, but there was a harvest coming and, you know, he preached about harvest this, that night and, um, and it was almost like it went over the top of the head of everybody in the room. And, you know, God sent like this guy, he looked like a homeless man and he was sitting out uh, at the exit, just as we, everybody thought, oh, that was a good message, my word, yes. And, and then, you know, had muffins and cakes and coffee and then all just filed past the homeless man. And as I was walking along the footpath, my wife Joy was with me and the Lord said, I want you to sit with him. So I went and sat with the homeless man. Well, he was, you know, looked like a homeless man. And, uh, and uh, he had a little bag with him and, um, and, you know, torn clothes and sitting there and hadn't shaved for a while. And um, I just said, do you know Jesus? And he said, oh, I know Jesus. And, but his eyes flashed and I thought, this is a setup. Because this, you know, this, this guy's eyes are saying something that he's not. And so I sat there with him and so we talked and, and, um, and then like, I just said, you know, I'd sneaked a muffin out and I said, Do you, would you like a muffin? And he said, no thanks, don't eat. I said, all right then. So, <laughs> so we talked about Jesus and he was like, you know, he was able to talk about Jesus as much as the next person. He loved Jesus and whatever that, you know, whatever that was in the conversation. And, and so then next thing he, um, I started, you know, I started to talk about, you know, what God was doing and he just, his eyes flashed again and he pointed at me and he said, that is the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And I went, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> just hit me like like a ton of bricks. Um, and I, since then I, I just take when seed is spilled really seriously. So anyway, we greeted each other. I insisted he take the muffin and, you know, he said, oh, all right, then I will. And he put it in his bag. And, um, you know, we, I prayed for him and, you know, he blessed me. And I got up to walk away and then I turned around to say goodbye and he was gone. Hallelujah. Like he was just gone. And so, um, I don't know, he was you know, an angel, I suppose. Uh, well, he was an angel. <laughs> and, um, and it was like, you know, like there was a message in that building and like nobody actually saw it and nobody. So when something prophetic happens, God, God wants us to actually grab hold of that prophetic announcement. And, and sister, thank you. Uh, that, was, that was no accident, right? You know, God just did, you know, it was just time. And those seeds, that's why I put water on them and I blew the shofar on them. And, you know, that's your life tonight. Yeah. You know, those seeds spilled in your witnesses. You're here because God's going to about to, you know, break things open in your families. And one thing I've learned is that Psalm 100 says that, says this, it says, um, what does it say? It says, <laughs> Psalm 100 says, uh, we enter his courts, no, sorry, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. Yes. 
and his courts with praise. So the connotation in the Hebrew uh, in that we enter his gates with praise, the connotation in the Hebrew is that his eyes, the moment we begin to give thanks, his eyes come on us. Oh, Jesus. If you've ever seen the eyes of Jesus, you understand that when his eyes come on you, it's like, okay, Jesus, I'm 300,000 ways undone right now because I just see your eyes come on me. And you know what that does? That's, that causes praise to well up in our midst. Thanksgiving always leads to praise. And the connotation in the Hebrew, so now we've entered through the gates. We're now standing in the courts of the Lord. You can take it as a legal system or you can take it as just the place where you meet with God. And right now, we're meeting with God. Hello. We're meeting with God. So what I want to do is I want to thank the Lord for the seed tonight. Hallelujah. And then we're, then we're going to just go wild. We're going to go, f in New Zealand, we would say we're going to go feral. And we're just gonna we're just gonna abandon ourselves in thanksgiving until we see a sound of praise rising up. And once the sound of praise begins to rise up, then we're just gonna praise until we whatever happens, we'll see what happens. But we're gonna thank him first for the seed. Yeah. You're gonna do it in sound, and we're gonna do it in dance, and we're gonna do it in Whatever you feel like doing, lying on the floor, jumping up and down. If you break the seats, you'll pay for them. <laughs> but you can jump on them if you're prepared to pay for them. <laughs> All right, so Jesus, come on, you need to stand for this. Because we're standing before the gates of the Lord. We're standing before the gates of entering into His presence. We're right there at the gates. And now it's time to begin to say, thank you, Lord, for the seed which has been sown. See, when a farmer sows seeds, he doesn't sow it on the bad place. He doesn't sow it on the rocky soil. He doesn't sow it where the birds can get it. He sows it where he knows he's going to get a crop and an increase. And I really believe tonight that the Lord has brought you all here because there's a harvest to be had. A harvest of souls, a harvest of increase, a harvest in your family, a harvest in your finances, a harvest in whatever. And we're just going to give thanks to the Lord for the harvest. So begin to thank Him. Till those gates swing open. Thank you, Jesus, for the seed, Lord. Thank you for the seed, Lord.
We thank you for your mercy, Lord, your love, which endures forever, Lord. We thank you. And I was just reading the other day, and I haven't, like, I haven't actually read Oral Roberts' book, Seed, Faith, or whatever it was, since the 1970s. But, you know, I was just reading the other day that when he was in, not too far away from here in Enid, Oklahoma, he was, like, broke and needed... God to really do something for them as a family. And, you know, like God moved on a farmer that had buried some hundred dollar notes in the backyard, as you do apparently. Um, And (laughs) um, I'd like to know where that farm is. He probably forgot where he put some of them. (laughs) Um, So anyway, he just, he came in like, because God spoke to him about planting seed, and I'm not going to—I'm not talking about finance, but it's seed of any thought. And he just dug up, found four of the hundred dollars he'd buried, four hundred dollars, and he just came and he sowed it into. And our Robert said, "That's just far too much money to give." And he said, "I'm a farmer. I, I know that if I don't plant good seed, then my crop will never, never bear good fruit." So he said, you're not going to tell me I can't sow that because 
I'm doing it for me, I'm not doing it for you. And so he sowed the seed and the rest is history because the Oral Roberts University and everything in your own state of Oklahoma is, is there because of that one man's faith to sow good seed. And, you know, like, I really mean it. I mean, this, this is like supernatural, this seed on the ground here. There's something really sovereign about what just happened. Um, and I don't know what that is exactly. You, you know, God will show you. But something's going to bear fruit from this weekend. And whatever that looks like, you know, you, you, you'll be able to look back to this weekend and say something really broke open. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you. Yeah. Because God loves obedient children. You know, my friend Kathy Walters says that when God's speaking, you should listen. You should do what he says. But if he's not speaking, go shopping. Because <laughs> he, you know, he doesn't have to speak to you all the time. But when he is speaking, we should listen. And he spoke tonight. You know, I'm not sure what I need to say apart from that because God's already been speaking. And, you know, like, so whatever, you know, when he sows seeds, it's like, you know, in your family tonight, just receive a harvest or the potential of a harvest. Just receive in your finances, receive in your work situation, your job, in your singing career. Just, just take it, brother. Take it. It's yours to have. And just remember this little lady here when you get really like multi-millionaire singing that she spilled the seed that night and she'd probably like a hundred dollars. <laughs> not now, but when you get rich. <laughs> well, she'd probably like a hundred dollars now, but not. Anyway, that's beside the point. I'm not, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God bringing an increase. And so that represents an increase right there on the floor. And what did that look like? Isn't it interesting how um, in the natural, you know, you, you, you sow seed after the toughest months. You know, like the winter's tough sometimes. You guys have it pretty easy down here. But up, up north further where they, you know, they have, I, I was in a place in, oh, Lake Tahoe. And, uh, you know, they had a, like a six-foot fence. And I said to her, so in the winter, how high does the snow get here? She says, well, see that fence? Well, that's probably under two foot of snow. Um, and um, not much grows under there. So they're really hard months. And sometimes in our lives, we have real hard months. We have hard times. Sometimes it feels like we have hard years, uh, hard decades. But you know what? God never forgets. And, you know, there's always springtime and harvest. That's what it says in the scripture. And why does it say springtime and harvest? Because there's got to be a springtime before there can be a harvest. And the feasts of Israel mirror that. You know, the spring, you know, the spring feasts are all about, you know, prepare, preparation, preparing a lamb, preparing a heart, preparing everything. You know, it's all about preparation. And the, and the autumn feasts are all about celebration and a harvest and a habitation. And like, God is so good. So we've got springtime here. We've got springtime. So Lord, we thank you for springtime. We thank you that you've brought spring into our midst and, and you're having spring here next week. <laughs> so, so it's springtime in Caleb. <laughs> um, springtime in Caleb, that sounds good. I, I want to just bless, I want to bless you. Thank you so much for having me here uh, in Oklahoma City. That's where we are, right? Yeah. Oh, my glasses just broke. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I've got another pair. Oh, probably. Yeah, it did. Here it is. Praise the Lord. 
We've got a glass fixer in the house. I, I really wanted to share w- with you tonight about something. <laughs> um, what I want to share about is... is a <laughs> yeah, he's always doing this. I really want to share about... Um, <laughs> wow, God is so good. God, you know, there's a harvest of love coming to the earth. And um, there has to be a harvest of love. Because, and there's a harvest that looks like, so when Enoch, you know Enoch, he's the, he's the was not. All right, so God took him and he was not. All right, so Enoch's a was not. And so, and so, you know, when Enoch, in the book of Enoch, at the, at the end, it says, some, well, not right at the end, but near the end, it says something like, Enoch saw, you know, the, the amazing things that, this is the NIV, the New Ian version. So, so he saw the amazing things that God was going to do with sons at the end of the age. And Enoch, Enoch said something like, well, <laughs> I like that. I want to live there. God said, all right then. I need a DNA marker at the end of the age so that human DNA will be able to recognize what they're supposed to look like at the end of the age so you can go there. And God took Enoch because, and he became a was not, but he's not really a was not because he's still living at the end. He's still very much alive and he's living at the end of, end of what it looks like to be a son. He, he came back a few times, if you look at, like, you know, when Noah was born and a few other times to bring instruction, and he pops in from time to time, even now. I mean, I'm not sure whether that, ha- you know, whether you like that sort of stuff or not, but I think you probably do. I mean, he does pop in, and, um, and you know, we don't worship Enoch. We don't worship the things he says or anything else, but we acknowledge that he's a son and that he's modeling something. But there's one other, and his name is Yeshua, that he also is a marker in human history. He's in the midpoint, and he, he is the marker. He's the one who marks time and space for us. In fact, Jesus is in all the, the beginning, the middle, and the end, because he is God. And so, um, you know, he is the was, the is, and the is to come. And so you also are the was, the is, and the is to come. You're, you're living outside of time and space. You're living in the was and the is and the is to come. What are you talking about, Ian? Well, you must be because Paul says that you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And, you know, it's not just something that you write, that Paul needed to, you know, write a few words because he didn't have quite enough to pack out a message. It's actually the truth. We are seated with Christ literally in heavenly places. That's who you are. Okay, you manifest here and you manifest there. We are manifesting in two places at once and you think, well, you're talking about Ian. Jesus said that of himself in John chapter something. Read the whole book of John. I can't remember what it is. Um, You'll find it. And it says there that Jesus says, you know, that, you know, he, he actually says he's here and and there at the same time. That's the NIV again. It's just, he's in both places. He, he declared himself to be in both places. You know, you are too. And so when God begins to move in your life and when God begins to move in, the, in, the, in, human, in humanity, which he's about to do, the acceleration of this being in two places at once and understanding who we really are is actually an awesome event. In human history, thank you. Woo-hoo. I think they might have cleaned them as well. They did, I can see out of them. That's a change. <laughs> thank you, Johnny. <laughs> well, man, isn't that awesome? <sighs> Father, we just thank you that, Lord, as we come before you, Lord, you're going to open up a way where there is no way. I feel like, I mean, I put a thing on Facebook the other day, and some of you may have seen it, but it's about acceleration. And like, I'm not just, I'm not just a prophet who Sunday Mondays on Tuesday and declares things because it seems like a good idea at the time. I don't 
believe in that. And there is a bit of that in the body of Christ, I have to say. And, and you know, like hot words and hot message prophets know the right words and the right thing to say. And if you put those sort of words out, they get a million hits on Elijah List. And I'm sorry about that, but that's just the truth. God's looking for a a bunch of prophets who will actually begin to see in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, receive in the Spirit, and actually uh, release in the Spirit. You know, like, because like the time of mature sons is here. So God needs his mature sons not to actually put on a show or to be like a circus clown or or a performing seal. You won't get any of that from me because I might look like a performing seal, but I'm not one. And, and, and I really believe that God is, is looking for children, sons and daughters who will actually do what Jesus said. It says in the scripture that we will, um, that we will do what Jesus did. It's, it, it's, it actually says that these things shall you do and greater than these, greater than these. Say it with me. Yes, Ian, greater than these shall you do because Jesus said, because I go to my Father. Well, you know, we haven't even done the these things yet. You know, we're still working on the these things. You know, we get excited when, you know, an ingrown toenail gets healed and we should do. (laughs) But, you know, never lose that childlike excitement that God heals the sick and raises the dead and all those other things. But, you know, God's looking for us to actually rise above all of that and start manifesting uh, what it looks like to be a son on earth. I mean, Jesus did a lot of things that weren't recorded in the Scripture. How do you know that, Ian? Because it's in the Scripture. It says, it says that um, he did so many other things that if they were all recorded, John says, uh, that there wouldn't be enough books in the earth to contain. This is just in a three and a half year ministry period. Jesus did more than there'd be enough books to contain. So, he, you know, what the scripture is, what the, what the gospels are uh, for us as sons and daughters is a guideline to what it looks like to be a son. Is everything that Jesus did is not in there. So he's expecting us to actually step outside of our, uh, of you know of the guidelines, if you like, not outside the guidelines, but outside of the of, of the written word, and step into the living word. That's him, and actually begin to function in the realm of you know the miraculous that we we need to see in the earth. We really need to see in the earth. My wife used to sit cross-legged under a palm tree in India. Uh, um, before, you know, she was a cr- Christian growing up, then she went off the track and, and like went into this new age thing and, and floated around India for 12 months and went to ashrams and did stuff. And, you know, like some of those gurus uh, in, the, in, in, the, in India, like they can, they make rainbows appear in the sky. They do stuff that uh, would freak you out and Christians, oh, no, no, that's terrible. Well, it is terrible because they're doing it. Because, but, you know, they're trespassing on the spiritual realm that we actually own. And so if you want to, if you want to begin to, if you want to keep living in your, I'm just barely getting by and my seeds are still um, stuck in some barn somewhere and never seeing the daylight, well, good luck to you. But God is looking for you to take those seeds out and actually begin to scatter them and saying, God, we're really believing, Lord, in 2018 that this is the year when sons begin to manifest what it truly looks like in the great many other things Jesus did, but they're not recorded. And if they were, there wouldn't be enough books on the earth to record them. This is the season that I'm believing that we're in. Yeah. <clears throat> and so how are we going to, how are we going to enter that technology? And I did put it on the internet, but I'm, I'm live and in person tonight. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm going to release that over you right now because there is a technology and the technology is, you know, everything has technology. And God is into technology. And the, technolo- the, techno- the technology is, is that um, God takes us into another dimension. Um, you know, you actually live in another dimension, but it's actually possible for you to go in bodily. Uh, sometimes you remember and sometimes you don't. Paul, the apostle, you know Paul? Paul, the apostle said, um, I, I was um, caught up into the heavens, uh, whether in the body or not. I, don't ask, I was drunk. <laughs> That's really what Paul was saying. I can't remember. I think I, I think I could have been in the body, but Paul said, but who knows? That's what the NIV says. But the truth is, um, God is catching us, and the season for being caught into those realms is now. 
And, and you know, there's, it's important that you understand why God wants to do this. Because, you know, like people look at me with glazed eyes and say, well, why is that even important? Well, it's important because when your body goes outside time and space, like you can do that in the spirit anytime you want, but when your body goes outside of time and space, God's able to download into you. Bob Jones used to say, uh, and you need to honor Bob Jones, lived in the hills just up the road. Bob Jones used to say uh, that, that God can achieve more in like five minutes in the realm of the spirit than he can in 20 years of you going to Bible college. And, um, and I want to release you into understanding that, that you need to be open to the fact sometimes you'll remember and sometimes you won't, but you need people around you who are going to tell you, you disappeared. Because sometimes you know and sometimes you don't. And um, Mark Steen, some of you who know who Mark Steen is, he's a musician and a mystic and a speaker and a friend. And Mark was speaking um, at a conference that we did together called something... I um, don't know what it was called. And as he was speaking, Mark plays the guitar pretty seriously, uh, and he sings. So when he sings, he, 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 he steps forward like this, and then when he's about to do like something on the guitar and not sing, he'll step back like this, as you do, apparently. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and so when he was doing that, in the natural, like it just looked like Mark was stepping back. Because sometimes when things happen in the spirit, they happen so fast that our, our, our human frequency that we're operating on, we don't see it. So God is wanting you to understand that there's a frequency involved here. This is a frequency lady sitting in the front. She knows what I'm talking about. There's a frequency that when sometimes we don't see it in the natural, but God allows us through tech, you know, human technology, but God technology really released to humans, that, um, that we can see things. And I was videoing Mark just because I was. And when I videoed him, um, when he stepped back on the video, he disappeared. So he stepped back and he went completely off the screen. I mean, not off the screen. I mean, he was in the middle of the shot. He just disappeared. And you know how you can count this? He disappeared for over three seconds. And then he stepped back into the frame again when he came to, started to sing again, and like he was there again. The natural eye didn't catch it, but there was a three second period on the video where you caught it. And I stopped the video and I looked and I reversed it and put it back and this, saw him stepping in and out. He went into another dimension completely. And um, so nobody knew that uh, except the video caught it. And so, why is that important? Well, you know, Mark had just written a song called Perfected Love on the way down to the conference, actually. We stopped at a rest by and it, God just downloaded a song to him and it was called Perfected Love and it's on the album Harmonics of Love if you want to get that song, that, that album and you'll all want to buy it uh, when, when, you, when you hear how, what happened. So it's called Harmonics of Love. So... <laughs> Mark finishes the conference with me. We drive back to Auckland. He, I put him on a plane and I wave him goodbye, give him a hug uh, and say, nice, you know, it's been awesome. You know, when he got home, uh, there was an email waiting for him that um, it was an unknown email address, but it said, Mastered, Master of Harmonics of Love. Mark had just written that one song, but... We, when he got back, there was a fully digital, because Mark does his own albums. It takes him like four or five months to, you know, he does all the engineering and everything himself. So it takes four or five months to um, engineer a, an album properly full time, working day and night almost. Uh, so when he got back, he hadn't even written the song before he left. And when he got back, there was a fully mastered album called Harmonics of Love waiting on his email to be sent to the people who press the, you know, to go to, you know, iTunes and all those other people. And so how did that happen? Well, the only explanation it is that when he stepped back into another realm for three seconds, 
because he's when you step into another dimension you're stepping outside of time and space so you don't know how long that is so three seconds obviously was months because in that three seconds that he stepped backwards he mastered an album called harmonics and love and the whole world should be buying it because it's like it's obviously anointed <laughs> it came out of heaven it came out of somewhere it came out of another dimension and so um, encourage you to buy it. Um, and um, so, so that was interesting right there. So that gave me the principles, if you like, of acceleration. I understood from that time and that conference, I understood that actually the way God accelerates things into the earth is not by dropping you know, one single revelation onto somebody like me, although that sometimes works. Sometimes it doesn't. I'm a bit dense. But, but it's better if he takes me out of it. <laughs> but, you know, like... That, that's the way we operate in the anointing realm, all right? So, so God drops something on us and we release it. That's, that's called the anointing. But in the glory, uh, you know, this um, kingdom glory, in the kingdom glory, I believe the acceleration comes because God takes us into another dimension bodily and actually downloads things to us that, that, that would take years sometimes to actually receive. And we step back in there. So I don't know what yet... Um, is coming, but I want to tell you that I was at the movies. Um, I'm not sure if that's acceptable to you, but I was, and it was good. I can't remember what we watched, but my wife and I usually go to the movies on a Thursday because that's the, you know, we get we get time together and we are hidden in a movie theater and nobody knows where we are and it's good. Uh, and, and so, you know, so we went to the movies and I had popcorn that was hers in one hand and I had an ice cream in the other hand that was mine, um, but, and. <laughs> And so she was going down the steps uh, towards our seats and I was following along behind her and then what seemed to happen in the natural was that I seemed, I, I didn't trip, but it felt like I fell into, back into the realm from a height. And when I fell in, I had to put my hand up against the wall to balance myself. The popcorn went everywhere. Uh, the ice cream was saved. <laughs> Uh, just saying. And so, you know, and so when I balanced myself, remembering that Joy was here and I was behind her in the natural, that's what it seemed like. So I was just walking behind her and then fell into the realm and then, and then put my hand against the wall to balance myself because I fell in and, and that's what it really felt like. And then, then I looked around and she's already in her seat and like, how did you get in there? Like, you know, she was right with me. And she was like looking around, wondering where I was. And, you know, after the movie, because it was about to start, she said, where did you go? I hope you didn't take my popcorn to the toilet. <laughs> I said, why, why is that even worrying you? It's all on the floor. Um, but no, um, I didn't. And I said, what do you mean? I was with you the whole time. He said, no, you weren't. Um, you were gone for about five minutes. And I was looking everywhere for you. You just weren't here. It was at least five minutes from the time that I got into my seat. And I thought you had gone to the toilet or gone somewhere. I disappeared. I was caught into another realm. And I don't know what happened in the other realm. I don't know. I've been checking my emails to see if there's a four or five new books in there. <laughs> but at this stage, I haven't had that email. <laughs> but I want to tell you that this is the technology for acceleration. I'm expecting acceleration in my life. This is a prophetic sign for me that, that more acceleration is coming, that the seeds are already planted, that something is about to be released in the realm of the kingdom that's going to bring forth a big harvest. And I'm believing for a huge harvest in the earth in my time because one thing I've been a little confused over is I keep saying to the Lord, Lord, uh, I really honor Bob Jones as a prophet. I love Bob Jones and I love what he carried and he's really fathered a generation of seers that, and released that realm back into the earth. That, and that was what he did. And um, so I honor him and everything he did. But I keep saying to the Lord, Lord, he talked about a billion soul harvest and a billion soul harvest doesn't seem enough to me. I keep saying, God, it's, it doesn't seem enough. 
like this over 7 billion people, pretty soon there'll be 8 billion people on the earth and you're only picking out a billion? I don't think so, Jesus. That doesn't match with the principles of your word because like a third of the angels fell, a third of the stars fell, a third of this fell. And, and so, Lord, if that's the case, there should be really, there should be a harvest of five or six billion people uh, in our generation. So, Lord, I'm, I'm not happy with this one billion soul thing. Just saying, because I'm not. Because I'm thinking it's not enough, God. It's not enough. What, you know, why be satisfied? It's not enough. And so the Lord said what I released into Bob was the revelation that there's a billion soul harvest of sons coming. But the world wasn't ready to hear it. And then he said, Ian, Satan had a headache with one Jesus walking on the earth. What's it going to look like when a billion Jesuses, when the sons begin to manifest, you know, greater than these, when these things and greater than these, when a billion soul harvest of sons begins to manifest, five billion soul salvation harvest doesn't seem hard. Really? Come on. And so how's that even going to happen? It's going to happen by re- saying, Lord, you need to release the technology into me that, that whatever, whatever this looks like, uh, however this works, Lord, and I still don't know how it works because, like, I'm a Blackberry Bush Christian. Stuff just happens to me. Uh, and, you know, I don't have the pro- you know, 15 protocols to get 16 result program. If you're wanting that from me, then you, you need to talk to um, Debbie or Steve or somebody. But I, I don't do the, the protocols. All I'm saying is you just need to put yourself in the way of encounter. You need to stand in the way of encounter. And I keep, you know, I'm, I'm a bit agricultural in my language. I understand that. But, you know, tr- the truth is if you go and stand in the middle of the road, sooner or later you get run over by a bus. You know, um, you know, it's just, it's just the odds. You know, it's like people will swerve around you, but eventually some driver will be checking his text, and and he'll run you over because he missed the fact that you were standing in front of him. Because that's just modern driving, right? So, so the truth is, if you stand in the way of something, you'll get run over. And the truth is, if you stand in the way of the throne of God, you'll you'll get run over. And that's actually what God's looking to do. He's actually wanting us to bow before the throne, but if we don't bow, he'll run us over with the throne. And and, and so there's a there's a season of acceleration coming and I, I want to be run over with the throne over and over and over and over again. Uh, I just need, Lord, I'm greedy. I just want everything that you've got for this generation I want to be able to release while well, I've got breath in my body, Lord. I, I want to release, Lord, the sound of a billion soul harvest of sons. I want to release a five billion soul harvest of, of salvation. I want, to rele- I want to see, Lord, the enemy totally routed. I want to see the scripture that says where it says that the, 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 the last enemy to be overcome is death. I, I want to live to... <coughs> I want to live to see death totally under the feet of the sons. You know, that you choose whether you want to go home or not. Uh, And, uh, you know, it's happened in church history. Uh, I've asked the Lord about this. And and, and I've asked him, uh, you know, has this happened in church history before? Because it says in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3, it says this. It says that Messiah shall remain in heaven until the restoration of all things. And my Bible says in the book of Genesis that Methuselah lived to 949 years. And a lot of others, Adam was 900. Uh, the other the others in the, in the generations of Noah were all into the eight, 890s to 950 range. Uh, that's a long time. Uh, but that was okay for them because they had contemporaries to walk with. You know, and Seth obviously lived a long time after um, after the flood, you know, when he stepped off the, stepped off the boat. <laughs> and, um, and God needed that as well because he needed somebody to, to declare and to speak the things that God had done before the flood. So there was a link in Seth who some who some Jewish scholars say is like Melchizedek, um, and the, that Seth founded the city of Salem, and and lived there. That's you, you can take that or leave it. It's not. I'm not. 
you know, I don't dismiss or accept anything. I just share stuff because that's very Jewish. And you've got to understand that this is, this, is, this is how it should be in the kingdom. We don't dismiss a ministry because they don't adhere to what you believe or what you release. But some of the, but you know, 70% of the stuff they do release, you like. So you just take the 70% until God gives you either revelation that the 30% is good as well or, or it's just an opinion. And so, you know, this, we've got to get mature as sons. And the only way we're going to get mature is put our way, ourselves in the way of encounter and say, Lord, you need to catch me into encounter. You need to take me into encounter. You need to take me to stand outside of time and space to that place before the foundation of the world where Jesus was crucified in the was before the was was and that place where there is no sins, sickness, suffering or Satan because he hasn't even created yet. So the good, the, the, the amazing thing about being inside of Jesus uh, is, is that you can be in the was, the years and the years to come because that's where he lives and that's where he dwells because he's not, he's not, bound by time and space and actually neither are you. I think I said last time I was here for those that were here, I think I probably said this, that the only reason we have time and space is because God needed somewhere as a prison for the enemy. Time and space is actually a prison for Satan and the fallen angels. They can go right to the edge of time and space, which is way out into the universe. They can, they can do all those things and they can pretend they're, they're amazing beings, but they have no access to the multi-dimensions that you have access to. And if you're hidden in Christ, He can't even see you. You know, most, most Christian bookshops are churning out stuff that make people fear the devil. You don't have to fear the devil. You just have to hide in Christ. You have to realize where you're seated because if, if I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, Satan can't even see me. Sometimes I poke, step out and go, nah, 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 nah. And then jump back in before he turns around because he doesn't know where I'm coming from. We were in Jerusalem. I don't know. Uh, uh, we go most years, so I don't know what year it was. But we were in Jerusalem, and a friend of mine and I went and started blowing shofars all around the walls of Jerusalem. We, we went around the walls, and we. And the cool thing about that is that because it like um, it, because it echoes around the city, nobody quite knows where it's coming from, and so nobody can tell you off because nobody quite knows where it's coming from. <laughs> And so we, we, we just blew shofars right around the wall, right around the old city of Jerusalem, and the whole city was echoing with the sound of shofar. I've got, I've got this brilliant shofar. I, ca I can't blow that one quite as well, but I've, I've got one that's just tuned to, my, to me. A and uh, it found me, and I blow it, and it resonated through the city of Jerusalem. Why, am I, why was I saying that? that? was the reason for it. Um, um, yeah, it was something to do with Israel. Uh, anyway, way off track. Um, but it was good, whatever it was I was going to tell you. You'll just have to go into an encounter to find out what I was supposed to say and say, God, what was he supposed to say? Because he obviously missed it. <laughs> and God says in a very Jewish way what to do. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jesus. I, I, really, I really want to say to you that um, many of you in this room tonight are not here by accident. And I wasn't going to preach this tonight, but I, I find myself being backed into a corner because of that staircase going up into glory there. <laughs> um, <laughs> find myself backed into a, well, find myself backed into a corner. Don't want to fall on that. Um, backed into a corner um, because I feel like <laughs> God wants to release technology. We could get some of that glass and put on those spikes, you know. Um, God wants to release, you know, technology into you to technology that will actually make people go. <gasps> when I was at Enid, Oklahoma, you know, you know, Enid, I, I felt like the Lord started to download some thinking to me that um, I, ju I just need to release. And the, the thinking is, I thought about people like Stephen Hawking's. Who, who had a brilliant mind, like a mind beyond minds, a mathematician beyond mathematics. Stephen Hawking used to say that 
by sheer mathematics he could he he could he could uh, he could you know through mathematics um, map creation back to a single point, but he could never work out what started it because mathematics because the equation that he needed to put into the mathematics he said doesn't exist and which is God. I'm not saying that he didn't go go to heaven because like he had he was preached to so much that you know he probably said ah it's real <laughs> and cried and called out to the name of Jesus because he knew to do that because his wife that you know stuck with him all those years and then left when he ran away with another lady um, she was a believer and she told him and loved on him and blessed him and he knew about Jesus but he never could accept that this was the truth. Why am I saying this? Because in generations past, at times of great scientific discovery, the scientists were also plugged into God. Albert Einstein, Newton, you know, they, they were plugged into God. And so the, the missing link of revelation in the earth currently is that there's a whole generation of scientists who are humanists, who are not and so, it, you know, there's still revelation being released to the earth because God needs things to go at a certain pace. But the glory that needs to come to God is not coming to God currently. And science is seen as superior to faith. What I felt in Enon, Oklahoma was God said, watch the scientific community, Ian. Because I'm going to catch some of them into these encounters that I'm talking about. They're going to know that they've been an encounter and they're going to release stuff into the earth that is just like, Ugh. it's been declared prophetically and I'm prepared to do it now because I saw it in Oklahoma. I saw it in Oklahoma. I saw that actually in five to 10 years, cancer will be a thing of the past. I saw that heart disease and other things that are killing mankind uh, in maximum of 15 years will be a thing of the past. I saw uh, technology coming into the earth that uh, is beyond belief. My grandfather was born in 1885. Um, don't try and do the maths. Math, you say, yeah. We say maths, because English is maths, but America says math. Don't do the math. <laughs> but don't say math in England, Australia, or New Zealand or Canada, because it's maths. <laughs> it's got an S on it. <laughs> okay, just saying, just teaching you English here. So, but, but, <clears throat> but um, you might be right, I don't know. Um, but what was I saying? Right. Yeah, so this, my grandfather was born in 1885. When my grandfather was five years old in 1890, you try and talk to him about an aeroplane or a mobile phone or a microwave oven or even an oven <coughs> or electricity in New Zealand. They didn't have electricity in 1890 in New Zealand. You talk to him about penicillin. Talk to him about radar. Talk to him about automobiles. Um, just wasn't going to happen. Steam engines, you could have talked to him about that because they existed. What, I, what am I trying to say? I'm saying that that which we can't even imagine is coming into the earth. You, you try and imagine, if you had no concept, apart from Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of a, something that looked like an aeroplane, if you had no concept of, of flying, you know, a several ton thing through the sky, and now America's skies are so crowded, you know, you've got to have traffic controllers popping pills so they stay awake long enough to know that you're, you know, you're, <laughs> you're not going to crash. <laughs> Please, Jesus. Um, so, <laughs> you hear me? So, this revelation is about to be released in the earth. There are bright children out there right now that 
there's a generation of children, my grandchildren's age, somewhere between like five and 20. Uh, this, that generation are no longer satisfied with the religion of their parents. They're no longer satisfied. It's not that they don't believe because that generation is going to come in lock, stock and barrel. They, my, my granddaughter uh, is an amazing seer. She sees. I, my daughter I, is a seer too. I just keep telling her, don't stop her. Just keep encouraging her, train her, teach her that you know, this is normal behavior. This is, normal, this, is, this is a normal way to function. And so, you know, we, this generation, have a responsibility to encourage and father and release, you know, another generation of, like my daughter's age, to actually encourage the next generation to, to actually be open to the sound of the technology of heaven because we're about to see a release of technology beyond belief. I'm declaring it in Oklahoma for the first first time. I mean, I know other people have said it. I'm declaring it in my ministry for the first time in Oklahoma that this is coming to the earth. Amazing, amazing, amazing technology. Spiritual technology. Because the you know scientists have got to start plugging in. Because there is a third strand to d to the DNA link. They know about the two strands, but in, the moment they begin to declare that the third strand, which is the spiritual strand of a DNA uh, of, a, of a DNA structure, at the moment they start to declare that the sci the speed at which things are going to go scientifically is absolutely incredible. It's like you know, with the oils and light technology and frequency, uh, all that stuff that, you know, we, we probably wouldn't have understood you know, 10 or 15 years ago, but now the understanding that is coming into the earth. And I believe that why I'm here this time is just to release that into this atmosphere over this place that, you know, we've got the well here, you know, we're going to have a wellness center here. We're going to have like, you know, a patent office here. That's a good idea. Now let's have a patent office. Uh, here because because if we truly believe that God is going to begin to catch people and if you get an idea write it down as, as foolish as it seems uh, because you you just don't know what you've got and you might have like you know that um, uh, the Big Bang Theory you know you might have a young Sheldon Cooper uh, uh, that television program you don't watch TV because you're all too oly but uh, but as I like it it gives me a laugh. And so, um, <laughs> you know, I watched a young guy online. So, you know, um, and he was mm, seven and he was being interviewed by uh, some scientist and the seven-year-old had come up with like some theory to do with, I'm just trying to think of what it was now. It was to do with creation anyway. And, and oh, that's right, it was he could prove that God existed uh, through scientific theory. And I thought, yes, Jesus, this is the generation. You know, this is, and, and so I just need to not, of, not offend you because I don't want to offend you. I'm just trying to help you understand. So Billy Graham just passed away, 100 years old, 100 years to, to the day almost that he was conceived. So really he had been in the earth for a, Hundred years, just saying. So, so God, God had planted something in Billy Graham that manifested in 1947, the same year that Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin and all those people started manifesting something new in the earth. And what Billy Graham, he 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 released the sound of a stadium ministry. And and while you know that's a good thing, and please don't be offended with me, but I don't think it's stadium ministry this time, but it is evangelism. And, and so we got to understand that what Billy did in 1947, nobody else had really done up until 1947. The evangelism they did before that was different. Billy Graham released something, and so for 70 years, a generation, just saying, uh, we've, we've actually had a generation where the sound of the frequency that Billy Graham released into the earth has been what we're supposed to be doing. But something shifted when Billy Graham died. And, and so now 
uh, and Bob Jones prophesied that it would. So now that Billy Graham has gone, uh, you know, a lot of people are starting to try and hire stadiums and things like that. And it's all good. It's okay. I don't have a problem with that. And they'll get people saved. But the mass salvations that we're going to see are not going to come through stadiums. Um, are you broadcasting this? Because I might upset a few people. Um, I'm not dismissing it. You know, please keep doing it if that's what you feel God is asking you to do. But there is a move of God coming, which is technology. It's coming through technology. It's coming through technology. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Knowledge comes through technology. Knowledge comes through, um, you know, it says men will be going to and fro in the earth. Um, and, you know, for a long time, people were saying, well, you know, that's airplanes. I don't think it is. I think it's, tr I think it's being trans-relocated in the spirit. Men will be going to and fro in the earth. I'll pop in here on a Tuesday night and bring you a message. I'll be gone and back in my bed before Joy even knows I'm gone. <laughs> well, she might come with me. I'm, I believe this. I believe that, we're, you know, like the Lord started speaking to me about four or five years ago about, you know, the technology of resurrection, the technology of the power of the blood, the technology of transportation, the technology of the power of the name of Jesus, the technology of all that is about to be released into the earth beyond anything that you could think or imagine. And, of course, there'll be some people sitting in their seats saying, that just can't be God. But we bless them anyway, because when they see, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students in the university beginning to come into Christ because they're seeing through scientists who are now actually manifesting the sound of the third strand of the DNA and starting to release discoveries into the earth that'll free mankind from, you know, from disease and sickness that has plagued our generation. The technology is coming so that we'll be able to renew the earth. We'll be able to renew nature. We'll be able to bring things back. The technology is coming that will open up the realms. And it's like, this is all for the glory of God. This is all for the glory of God. Messiah shall remain in heaven until the restoration of all things. <clears throat> What does that mean? It means dodo birds are coming back. I don't know what animals are extinct in America, but I'm sure there's a lot. They're coming back yes. through heavenly technology. Wow. Just saying. Here's the thing. You know the Inuit people up there? Where's North? Oh, how about that? You know the Inuit people up there? Well, the Inuit people... Um, they, they, they had amazing statistics. They weren't exciting statistics, but they were amazing statistics. A few years ago, they had the highest murder rate per head of population of any group in Canada. The um, suicide rate was the highest, the alcoholism rate, the incest, the rape, the murder, and everything else. So it wasn't good statistics. And then God turned up. God turned up. And he went through, like my grandparents used to say, he went through the Inuit people like a dose of salts. <laughs> and they, they got on fire. And you know, the first thing they did, they recognized that they're the north wind. They, they, they got a revelation that they're the north wind and they immediately saw that Ezekiel 37 was being fulfilled in, in their lifetime, that it was now their responsibility to declare into the south wind and the east wind and the west wind that the wind would begin to blow. Why would the wind begin to blow? So that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would be released. They actually asked New Zealand for a flag because they recognized that we're the furthest place away from Jerusalem and the earth in the same way that they're the furthest part away uh, from Jerusalem in the north. Did you know that? So, so it's sort of in Alaska, northern Canada, uh, is the furthest part uh, northern, to the north away from Jerusalem. Use a pin, check it out. Don't take my word for it. New Zealand is definitely the furthest away landmass 
from Jerusalem. So they immediately began to declare and to pray into New Zealand that the south wind would begin to blow. And we have a volcanic region. It's called the Tonga Riro uh, region. And Tonga Riro means um, carried on the, north, on the south wind. And every time something happens in Israel, 1948, Israel became a nation. 1947, when the United Nations gave sanction for Israel to become a nation, uh, the, one of the mountains on that, on that volcanic region um, woke up. Uh, in 1948, when they became a nation, it erupted. Uh, 1967, one of those mountains erupted when Jerusalem came into the hands of the south wind, being carried on the south wind. Get me? So last year, or just leading into last year, I think it was, um, what was the significance? Oh, that's right. It was a hundred. It was a last year. It was like a hundred years since uh, the Ottoman Empire was driven out of Jerusalem, and Tongariro had a had a spit, the Mount Tongariro. That is not the Tongariro region. So it was Mount Tongariro, which which is always smoking a bit, but it blew a piece completely off its side, going woohoo! <laughs> in celebration for something that's happening in Jerusalem. And, you know, why am I saying this? I don't know. Because I started saying about the Inuit people because there used to be stories amongst um, the, and there's probably stories amongst Native Americans here that you need to sit down and listen to. But there were stories amongst the Inuit people that, you know, there were, there were types of berries and fish and things that this generation had didn't even know what they looked like or taste like. And this is recorded. So the other thing is that Canada, about the time that the move of God started in, uh, in the Inuit territory, decided that they would draw a line and gift back um, the territory to the Inuit people. And it's now called Inuit Territory. Or, uh, and, so, uh, and so it's an independent, well, not independent, it's part of Canada, but it's, it's like, uh, you know, they, they're self-governing. And so the moment they became self-governing and in Christ, they started discovering diamonds. They just started discovering oil. They started discovering berries that their ancestors had said grew there, but nobody on the tundra, but nobody knew what they tasted like or looked like, and they came back. The seals started coming back, the walruses and things that they use for coats and food. They started coming back and they're breeding like rabbits beyond anything that was ever thought possible that some of these species they thought were going to become extinct. But God said, I need to bless these kids with food and oil and provision. This is what happens. This is the technology of acceleration that comes into the earth when God turns up. And I really believe that, you know, I might be just some like fat ball guy from New Zealand but God sent me here to make a declaration into the atmosphere. And this is like, Steve told me that like this is like the center of America right here. And so from the center of America, I put a stake in the ground. Uh, I put a stake in the ground. <laughs> can I use this? Oh, can I use this? Thank you. Are you sure? Don't just say yes. It's all right? Okay. <laughs> okay, so we declare and we release the sound of acceleration and the technology of t uh, <laughs> the technology of acceleration into the center of the United States of America. This is a great nation, and you never should forget that. And all the prophets who keep saying, prophets of doom who keep saying God's going to judge you, then they need to read the Bible because for 10 people, God would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah. And so instead of, instead of prophesying doom upon America, we should be crying out to God, God, if there be 10 righteous people in America, would you bless us? I've met more than 10 righteous people in America. It could be even 10 righteous people. 
I've met more than 10 righteous people in Christ. I mean, in this room, there's more than 10 righteous people. Is God going to judge America? No, because you're going to start saying, God, have mercy upon this nation. Lord, begin to carry us into the realms of possibility. Trans relocate us and transport us. Lord God, into the was before the was a was. Lord, take us into the realm uh, of the place where technology is downloaded. I went for five minutes of Mark could master and out and a complete album just by being away for three seconds, which means that, he, you know, in earth terms, it was like months. What, what was I doing? <laughs> what was I doing? What was I thinking? What was I doing? Uh, you know, being away for five minutes, that's like years in earth terms being in the realm of the Spirit. And so I believe that God has downloaded something into me that's just going to spring out of me one day. And I'm going to say, what? Where did that come from? And it happens to me all the time when I'm speaking. I have no idea what I'm going to say half the time. And after I finished, I still got no idea what I said. <laughs> and I do listen to some, I actually have to listen to my MP3 sometimes because God releases stuff through me that I really don't know where, you know, what it is or where it came from. It probably came from the years and years of rabbinical teaching and training that I've been in. I think that's what happened. Uh, and, you know, in that five minutes I was missing before I hit the wall. <laughs> so, Lord, we, we thank you and we release and we decree and declare. We thank you for the seeds that were sown over this place, Lord God, tonight in the glory. Why don't we just stand together? Because I feel like God wants to do something here tonight. He wants to release you into your destiny. And if you can't do it while you're awake, you'll do it while you're asleep. Lord, take and transport everyone in this room, Lord, into this sustained period of acceleration, whatever that looks like. Hallelujah. Healings, Lord, what you'll wake up in the morning totally healed because you've been in the realm of the Spirit where it's not possible to be sick, where there is no sickness, suffering, sin, or Satan. Father, catch your people into these realms. You know, like God, I really believe, is going to start, you know, because, you know, these days we have healing crusades that Christians come to because they're sick. So let's step out of that and actually say, God, hit me. Hit me with the realm of who we really are as sons. You know, we should be taking that healing out into the highways and byways, not having healing meeting, well, keep doing it, but, you know, like, you hear, hear me, hear my heart? Because we, we, we should be the healthiest, most amazing, awesome people on earth. I might even grow hair, although Joy keeps praying that I don't because she quite likes my bald head. And so I've got problems right there because God listens to her more than he listens to me. <sighs> so there you go. God's going to teach you how to be sons. God's going to teach you when to govern and when not to govern. God's going to teach you when to calm the storm and when not to calm the storm. God's going to teach you when to speak to the tornadoes and when not to speak to the tornadoes. What are you talking about, Ian? We just got to rebuke them all. No, you don't. You got to ask God, God, are you in the storm? God, are you? In? And he might say, no, I'm not. You need to rebuke that. Or he might say, yes, I am. So, just one quick testimony. You can sit down again for a minute, maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm a bit evangelistic. I'm going to finish in, like, I should have finished two minutes and five seconds ago, but I'm going to finish in a minute. You know, I just need to teach you something. Um, thank you so much. It's an honor to use that. Thank you. Um, this is an anointing on that stick. Um so just recently, New Zealand had this huge storm. I mean, we've had a lot of storms because we're a couple of, well, we're, we're actually multitudes of islands, but there are two and a half main, <laughs> main islands that are where the population base is. And so we had this huge storm came in and it coincided with a king tide. And so, you know what a king tide is, right? Oh, you're so far away from the sea, you probably don't. Um, so at, at a, when, you know, 
they're, they're called like a pedigree moon or a, or a, or a blue moon. Uh, the moon is actually at a closer point to the Earth than generally is. And so what that causes is it causes the tides to be uh, much bigger than they would be even at a normal high tide. So they become like a king tide. Uh, and sometimes the waves come in onto the land and so forth because king tides are huge. So this storm was coming in and it coincided with the pedigree moon, uh, which meant that um, we were having king tides. And when you get king tides and big swells, it ain't good. And so people were saying, we need to rebuke the storm. We need to rebuke the storm. And I said, okay, we perhaps do. So I said, God, do we need to rebuke the storm? He said, don't you dare. I'm in the storm. I said, right, okay then. Because that sort of flies in the face of a lot of stuff we're being taught right now. And so I said, okay, God, you got to tell me what this is all about. And he said, you just watch. And so I watched. And in 1820 something, 1821, there was a tribe, one of the tri Maori tribes in New Zealand, the Napui. Um, they, they had worked out that if they cooperated with the English, they could get weapons. And so they, they got weapons and the other tribes didn't have weapons. And so um, they, they, they went a raiding. And so they raided this group of people, the Hauraki people. It's a, a flat plain uh, where they dwelt. And uh, they went down and they basically annihilated a, a, an entire tribe and to the point where there was nobody left to bury the dead. And so they just left the bones lying on the... Uh, they just left the bones lying on the land. So the missionaries arrived around about 1832 and they were just amazed at the, at the fact that the whole land was covered in, in human bones. And they thought, this is bizarre. And that part of the nation, it's called the Hauraki Plains, um, have, has never really prospered. Uh, never prospered. Just it's hard to get anything going there. And the little towns that are there just don't work and like it just doesn't happen. And so this storm created such a storm surge that water came in across the plains to the hills, waist deep, salt water, and actually flooded the plains in salt water. And while that might seem like a disaster, the Lord said, Ian, I just cleanse the land. Can you hear my heart? Can you hear what I'm saying? We need to ask the Lord, Lord, do we rebuke the storm or do we let it happen? The de and I'll finish with this, said I was going to finish. But the Desert Fathers, they were a, a group of believers that, were, that removed themselves from, you know, like day-to-day -day life, lived in caves in the deserts of Egypt, of Syria, of modern-day Israel, of... Um, Iraq and all around there, the Desert Fathers. And so they, they, had, they had so pushed into God that they were living in such a governmental realm, and this might upset you a little bit, but they were living in such a governmental realm that even the demons had to report to them and ask if they could rough a town up. And God trusted them because they were, they'd come to a point of governmental maturity where God could trust the Desert Fathers to say yes or no because they knew the heart of God through intimacy. Can you hear my heart? So a lot of people want to govern in this current move, but they don't want the intimacy. You can't have the level of government that God needs to release into the earth. This is like way off track, but you can't have the level of government that God wants to release into the earth without the level of intimacy that's needed to actually exercise that level of government. So Father, we just thank you that right now that this hub and this house, this well, this place, these seeds, Lord, represent, Lord, a fresh release of maturity and governmental authority that, Father, comes from a place of intimacy. I release worship into this house beyond measure. I release falling down and can't getting up for days worship. I release, Father, the sound of the heartbeat of God 
God into this place. I release, Lord, that level of intimacy that, Lord, out of that will come, Lord God, a governmental flow. And, Lord, we will be able to say, Lord, is that your storm? And he'll say yes. And we'll stand and we'll say we're not rebuking it. Lord, we pray for mercy upon everybody that the storm is going to come in contact with. But, Lord, you have a higher purpose. And so we choose to step into your government and not into our thinking. See, there's a danger that, you know, the revelation that's coming into the earth right now uh, will release a bunch of immatures uh, and governing out of the soulish realms and the fleshly realms of understanding because it suits us. But if if the town folks start saying, rain, you go away, then the farmers are, the farmers are going to suffer drought. Yeah. Come on. Come on. And that's, as a farmer, you see, uh, ex-farmer, as a farmer, see, that worries me. It worries me that people are rebuking rain, they're rebuking storm. No, we don't want the rain. Really? Well, we actually need the rain. You know, so God, we, I'm taking governmental authority and calling that rain back in because we need it. Can you hear my heart? Because this is what we need to move into. The only way we're going to be able to move into that maturity is through intimacy and through being translated and transmitted into these encounters outside of time and space where God can download the maturity you know, that we need to operate in because it's it takes years to develop that level of maturity. We haven't got that much time. So God needs to call us and catch us into these realms and actually download that level of a maturity outside of time and space, which might be like 90 years of wisdom he can plant into you. You, know, you can come back and you can start to govern in the authority. We're going to rule and govern. See, you won't, you know, this whole nonsense that's going on, and sorry, it is nonsense. It's a bit of a joke in the rest of the world about how you, you as a nation, you're arguing uh, over, your, over your politicians. It's bad. Stop it. <laughs> just pray for the president you know God raised them up it doesn't matter whether you agree with them or not he's you know God raised them up so let's just get on with it uh, just saying and, and so so governmentally you know, who knows some Christians may be even governing against Trump some might be governing against the Clintons and they're wacky as whatever because of Christians governing We've got to come to a place of maturity where we govern out of the heart of God, not out of our own feelings, understandings, political leanings, elitist understandings, religious mumbo jumbo. We, we got to, we got to rule with maturity. So I'm releasing over this house the, the maturity to release into other sons, to train them. Lord, to understand times and tides and seasons, to understand the ways of God, to understand the love of God, the heart of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. Lord, that Lord, the revelation of the power of the blood of God, uh, Jesus, the power of the well, the might of His name is, Lord, the seven spirits of God and everything else that needs to be released as revelation in the earth that's going to bring, Lord, the ability for us to handle the technology that's coming. Because on the current level of maturity, we aren't going to be able to cope. But Father, just bring instant maturity into the body through trans-relocation into glory in the name of Yeshua. I release that into everybody in this room. Let these seeds that are on the floor bear fruit. And every heart in this room, every family member that's not even here, and if, if you are recording this, people listening on the recording, You'll receive the realm of this message, which is not my message. It's a message of acceleration in the name of Yeshua. Take it, eat it, drink it, get it inside you. Come back tomorrow night, bring 10 friends with you. We're going to have a ball. No, no, come back tomorrow morning. Yeah, come back tomorrow night too. But come back at 10 o'clock tomorrow and tell your friends to come because we're going we're gonna to kick butt. In Jesus' name. <laughs> amen. 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 Whoa. <laughs> amen. I'm at a loss. 
No, here comes my husband. See you to the rescue. <laughs> I thought it was interesting when, when Ian was talking about seeds. Because this afternoon when I was asking the Lord what to talk about for our offering portion, I went to the parable of the sower. And the parable of the sower is about sowing the seed it's about sowing the Word of God in a traditional understanding because the, so, the seed is the Word and the sower goes out to sow. But if you look, if you, if you read it and read it carefully, you'll see that it's really talking more about four different types of soil. Mark chapter 4, verse 3. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. So the first, the first types of dirt or ground was the seed the same in all four cases. In this case, with the seed on the ground. The problem is not with the seed. It's all good seed. It's where you plant it. The sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. So the first we see is wayside seed. And if we take this and we look at it as it pertains to our provision, to our, to where we sow. Okay? We can sow in this soil, we can sow in this soil, we can sow in this soil. Where are we sowing? The difference is it could be the same it could be the same provision, it could be the same money, it could be the same amount. And yet four different soils will yield four different outcomes. Can you see that? Let's say it's a ten dollar bill. That ten dollar bill could have four different outcomes depending on where is it sown. Is it sown in the hard soil? Is it sown in the thorny soil? Is it sowed or is it sown in the good soil? So the the, the provision is the same and what we've got if we're a sower, is we've got seed. And as we sow, if we sow into the wayside, what happens? The birds come and devour it. Have you ever sowed somewhere and given somewhere and there was no return? That's, that's seed that is sown. The, 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 the provision was good, but it got taken by Satan. Because in, in, in the next few verses, it talks about these are, Satan comes immediately to take out that which was sown. So if you just sow it on top, of, if, if, if you just throw it in the wayside, that stuff just lands on the surface. And the birds of the air can come down and pick it. And psh, did that seed make a tree? Did that seed do anything? It's, it's bird food. It just got eaten. The second set of soil is some s fell on stony stony ground where it did not have much earth. So you can have a, you, if you throw, throw a, a seed on top of a rock, there might be a little pocket in that rock that has a little bit of dirt. And that seed will land in that dirt. And it'll go down about half an inch till it hits bedrock. And it cannot, there's no way that it can generate a root and, and get hold of anything. It can't get a hold of water. It can't get hold of anything. So it's got dirt, but the Bible says it had no root. It had no depth of soil. It, so it sprung up immediately. So it, immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But then here comes the sun. The sun came up, scorched it, and because it had no root, it couldn't go down deep and get into that water source. So although it germinated, it was on the way out. And just a matter of time before the sun came up. And who's had, who's had times when the sun will come up and it's hot and you have nowhere to get your soil. You have nowhere to get your water. And then if you don't have any, if you're not plugged in, 
it, it, it's gone. The third type of seed, and some seed, verse 7, fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it would yield no crop. And in the explanation of that, um, he said that, and they have no root in themselves. Pardon me. Verse 18. Now these are they which are sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things, entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So these are the cares of life. These are the things, the stresses and the troubles that we get bogged down in and that, that, that gets the yield of our, our seed gone. But then the fourth final seed is sown in good ground. And the good ground is tilled, it's deep, it's fertile, it's been prepared, it's not just thrown on the top. When that farmer to uh, churns up that and, and breaks up the dirt clods, it becomes rich and fertile soil. Then when that provision is put in there, when the seed is planted in that soil, in that environment, it can, it can shoot down a root, it can find that water source. It can take root down downwards and then bring up a plant upwards and 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 become what it's supposed to be. So in all of these cases, what we need to look for is the seed is the same. It's where do we plant? We need to plant in we need to plant our provision if we want a good harvest. We need to plant it in good soil. It it blessed me when I saw seed being put in good soil and if you think about it each of us recognized i need to get up and sow you saw everybody and no one we, we didn't say that to anybody but one by one you you saw people esteeming the ground esteeming the harvest this is good ground and in fact they were they were dancing around it they were rejoicing around it what are they doing they're watering the seed they're esteeming the work of God that's being done right here. And we don't see in the spirit what was actually is happening. But yet what we're doing is we're esteeming that this is good soil. I'm planting into it. I'm dancing over it. I'm praying over it. I'm blessing it. I'm blessing my seed. And as Ian said, you wait to see what will happen, what comes up as a result of this. So... So as we, as we give tonight, as we, as we have already given, we just say, Lord, we thank you that, this, that we, 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 esteem, we esteem this as holy ground. And we, and we, and we give in. If, if you haven't given and you would like to, feel free. We'll leave the planters right here and, and feel free to give. But Father, we just thank you for this this. Um, for, for your seed that was sown this evening. And Father God, we just pray that you would bless each and every seed that is given. Bless it in the name of Jesus for your harvest, Father God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. The, it wasn't progressing properly. <laughs> I had to fix it. It wasn't progressing properly. So thank you for coming. And so right now, Lord, we just bless every person.
that is here. We bless them. We bless those who are listening on, online. Lord, we bless them. We just say everything that has been said, everything's been done. Lord, we just seal it by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, we receive what has been spoken. We receive the words from the, from the man of God, and we take it, and we will steward it, and we will water it, and we will grow it and esteem. We don't put it on the shelf, but we will esteem it and plant it and grow it. In Jesus' name, Lord, I bless every person. I bless their going in and their coming out. I bless them as they lay down their head tonight, that they will have dreams and visions and instruction in the night season. Lord, we welcome the angelic visitations now. Lord, I pray that you will bless them in their homes. I pray that laughter would reign in their hallways. Lord, I pray that you will bless their families, bless their finances, those who are sacrificing to be here. Lord, we just pray a hundredfold blessing upon their sacrifice right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you, they will be rested, come back tomorrow, and that we will enter into all that you have spoken for this time. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. And don't vacuum this. We're going to pick everyone up. Okay. <laughs>